here. All right. I'm forgetting so, how do I change my background? I don't want to change my probably under view, huh? No. You got to go to the upper, the upper green left. shield at the upper left, and then you click on settings. Oh, okay. And then go down to backgrounds. They make it complicated. Yeah, I was taking photos of Jupiter and Saturn Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday night, I think. Friday, I just did a handheld, but uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, I tried my DSLR, and, but uh, not that happy with it. And you know how, how you know, Jupiter and Saturn are so close to the horizon, you know, that didn't take long from the disappear and you're cutting yeah. through a lot of atmosphere. Yeah, I, I, de I decided to watch the uh, live video feed from the Anthony Chabot. They had a 36 inch daub there. <laughs> so, because it was so low below the horizon, I, I, could, I, I don't think I can even see it from, from my home. So Bob, yeah. where, did you, where did you take your picture from home or? or... Yeah, you know, I was, I was talking about um, going somewhere, you know, to see it. And then I got kind of lazy. I was sitting here, uh, you know, yesterday during the day and I, I was thinking of going up to East Camino Cielo and before, you know, about an hour before sunset and, and set everything up. And, uh, and I started thinking about it and I thought it's so low on the horizon. You get a little bit of altitude there, but I thought I'm still going through a lot of atmosphere. So yeah. I talked myself into being lazy and just do it for my backyard. So, um, yeah, yeah it's but a lousy game for planets. Yeah. Yeah. It's so low, but here, so here's the, uh, I'll move out of the way. That's the, uh, Orion picture I got. Wow. A lot of red in there. Yeah. I'm, you know, I can, that's that's because of me. I mean, I can tune it around and you know do it how I want. I'm not done with it yet. It's, you know, they call it the the center there. Um, blown out is the term that I was using. You know, but uh, I don't know. Still, I was just happy that you know with a semi unprofessional thing that I was able to you know get that. That was um, December twentieth, two nights ago. Um, got up at midnight and I did about an hour and a half of. Uh, of shooting it and then stack these images and everything to get get uh, the noise out. That so looks really good, good though. Well, I mean, so, uh, well, one thing you can do to to mitigate that uh, blown out effect is to just uh, use different expo different types of exposures. So I don't know what kind of exposure length you use, but but if, if I would take something with a DSLR, uh, I would go to five seconds, ten seconds, because you know Orion is so bright. Yeah, uh, and, and, and 30, 30 seconds or so. And then after that, it all gets blown out. Yeah, yeah. With I didn't have the uh, tracking, the guiding going well enough. So I had to okay. take some somewhat short exposures anyway. So yeah. yeah. But, well, what's cool did you Bob, use for Bob, that one? Bob, that looks really good, though. You can see all those gases. It's just amazing what's out there yeah. near yeah. Orion, yeah. the nebula. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I was relatively happy with it. I'll. Uh, in fact, let me. But it's a it's a very small field of view. Did Did you have a long uh, focal length scope, or is it just your your camera that's so that small? That camera. That camera. That's why it's it's. Um, I was just looking today <laughs> online for like focal reducers and thinking I'll buy a, uh -huh. a cheap focal reducer just so I can get more in it. You know, eventually I'm going to get a, a different camera that'll have more in it, but. This has the camera they say is the equivalent of about a six millimeter eyepiece is what it's doing. So it's, and I've already got a, you know, a, um, okay. Local length of, uh, or, a, you know, a, a thousand millimeter thing. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's zooming in too much, but uh, this was supposed to be a um, planetary camera. So uh -huh. um, you know, let's see, I'll show you the, the bigger one there. There's, there's how it turned out. Oops. Oh, okay okay yeah 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 i don't know kind of kind of fun fun for me you know i got a relatively okay focus you can see these are the stars are even oh, yeah. they're, they're tracking a little bit you know so i mean or, you yeah. actually can, you can kind of see that the trapezium in there just about make it out where's that That's right it down there. oh that right in there yeah, yeah. The four the four stars you yeah. know yeah that's that's wonderful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I was happy. What I mean, what's the res What's the resolution of that camera? 
Uh, I'll have to look that up to know exactly. Like in pixel size or something, I think it's like five, 10 or something, 10, pic, 10 megapixels. I think it's 3.74, something like oh. that, if I remember right. What camera is it? It's the ASI 224 MC. Okay. Yeah, color, color one, so. Uh -huh. Those are usually about three microns or something like that, right? Yeah, I, be I believe that's what it is, 3.74. Yeah. It's uh, the, let's see, it's it's a CMOS uh, X, XM224 or whatever uh, sensor. And the, um, yeah, the, the chip is like a third of an inch. It's um, 3.7 3 by 4.9 millimeters. So pretty, pretty tiny. <laughs> pretty small, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why um, I use the DFLR, I got 23 yeah. times 32, yeah. whatever, yeah, <laughs> pretty huge, Bob, yeah. Bob, what was that camera model again? Uh, ASI 224. Oh, it's ASI, it's not a ZWO. Well, ZWO, all their cameras are ASI. That's the company is ZWO and then they, they call them uh, ASI. Uh, huh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the significance is, but yeah. So the company ZWO and then the model numbers are all ASI something or another. So got Tim coming in. Uh, is he, he's got name recognition, but no <laughs> face so far. Yeah. He's got that slow tablet. That's what it is. Huh. Well, I've given away my uh, LXD55 mount. Oh. It's a mount that I got uh, many years ago when I actually, I saw a deal, uh, some guy in LA was selling um, an LXD55 mount with a Richie Crichan six inch for $430. I thought, oh, that's that's a reasonable deal. <laughs> I didn't have a, a go-to mount at the time. So so I got in and picked it up and, <clears throat> and I, I used it once and it had quite a bit of periodic error. So I took a bunch of shots and then just clicked through the shots just in the browser pretty quick. And you could just see this, the patterns. And it was just like, oh my God, I need a, an auto guider for that. So I got a, an auto guider from AstroGene. I don't know if you heard, guys have heard of that. He's got a website, astrogene1000.com. It's got all kinds of adapters and stuff. Uh, and that's an adapter. It's called an ADM909 or something like that uh, clone. Um, and it, uh, it lets you auto guide this thing. So it connects from the ST4 from the guide camera to the aux port on the mount. And I, I know it works, it got it working. So everything was still working. And uh, I put it on the free section of uh, Craigslist because it was just getting in the way. And it's an LSD 55. It's a piece of crap basically for astrophotography. So I can't ask much money for it. But for visual, it should be fine. Uh, this guy uh, is in Thousand Oaks and he's gonna pick it up on uh, Saturday. Um, and he's had an LXD55 before, so at least he's familiar with it. So you, you, so, you say it's an LXD? LXD55. What, 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 who makes an LXD55? Mead. Mead. Uh, oh. Mead doesn't exist anymore, but uh, the, the, the next level up, which was a popular model, is LXD75, one that has a lot few problems. It's software compatible. And then it went to Bresser. So now all these these exhaust mounts of Bresser, they are basically uh, the same thing, just rebranded, I think. As the when did Mead go out of business? Uh, who Mead or Bresser? Mead. Mead. Yeah. Well, you know that they go and they come back, and I, I have a feeling they'll come back someday. I heard some rumors that said they're trying to bring it back to life. We'll see. Yeah. So here, here are the specs on that camera. Yeah. Yeah, I, I put I put that link in the chat chat box. Okay. So it's it's only one point seven megapixel. Yeah. 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 I was so going to buy it primarily as a guide camera then. Um, people use it. They they this is in their um, they call it planetary. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a narrow field of view. 
Yeah, yeah. it has an SD4 port, right? It looks like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. And I um, haven't used that yet. I'm going oh. to, um, let's see, I was trying to, in fact, yeah, I, instead of doing the SD4, I'm going to, there's an adapter you run the SD4 to um, the, oh, I'm not saying it right. You do, you run the hand controller from the AVX mount to uh, a USB plug to the computer. And then I, I had the drivers and stuff for the AVX and I was trying this uh, last night and I, I had no success. I was sort of, you know, doing it at the end of everything else of the regular uh, photographing, but trying to trying to use uh, PhD2 for the first time to guide, not with this one, but with another ASI, I have the ASI 120 uh, MM, and uh, which is even sort of simpler than this. But uh, I, I couldn't get it to work. I, I think I had some problems with the driver, so I'm going to have to play around with that a little bit. Well, normally you you plug in, you, you connect the SD4 port of the auto guider with the SD4 port of the AVX, right? Yeah, and they they recommend not to do that, though. The, the, the point being that um, if you run it through the computer, you can have, you know, better control of it or whatever. They, that, they... That's a story. I'm, I'm not sure if I believe that. I mean, you're talking about SD4 versus ASCOM, right? Yeah, I, I don't buy that. Uh, the, the, everybody says that, but I, I, I think SD4 is just fine. I've always uh, used SD4, and uh, yeah, people, you, yeah, you can save one I, cable if you, if you don't, if, if you uh, go digital. But SD4, it's nice because it's convenient. It doesn't require a, a load of software or something like that. You don't, have, you don't, you don't depend on ASCOM. Yeah, and you can just I use it. The, you can uh, also uh, use it on, on Linux, and and because uh, Linux doesn't support any ASCOM, right? I mean, ASCOM is, is, is a horrible Windows artifact. It's a, it's a horrible protocol because it's, it's not distributed and it's not portable. It's only Windows. So it, yeah. it, it, needs, to, it needs to go. It's, it's a horrible monster. And, and it's just, it, it just throws the whole astro, uh, yeah, astronomy I, community. I've always back. heard that if you, uh, if you go through your computer for the guide scope, it can introduce a time delay that will start an oscillation in your tracking. So I've never done that. I've used the S4, S4 whatever yeah. it is, port. So the thing is, you, you go to an ASCOM driver on your on your host computer. And so yeah. the, the PhD sends its commands to that. It has a driver. It has to do some work. And then under the hood, it probably goes to, you know, some low-level commands that you might as well do. You know, it, it takes time. And, and SD4 is more direct, I think. So it's, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's just my, just my. I, I, everybody, that I'm open to be educated. Well, <laughs> and yeah, so you you said this before, and ultimately, when I finally do the uh, the Raspberry Pi thing, and I'm going to do the indie uh, uh, you know set of instructions and stuff, but I'm that's yeah. not, that's a future thing. But um, right, so if, if you if you do that, so the the way I started out with the Raspberry Pi is by using LinGuider, and I did that because LinGuider knows. Um, uh, SD4, and so I used SD4. Also, PhD, I also ran that on the Raspberry Pi. You can just download it. You don't depend on any other auxiliary stuff, software. Yeah. And uh, I also use that with SD4. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, but Indy has its own protocol. So if you would use ASCOM on uh, the, the laptop to avoid SD4, you can use Indy and not use SD4. So right now I'm not using SD4 anymore because Indy actually, if you use uh, ECOS, that's the name of the product, ECOS slash KSTARS. I don't know what the final, no I mean, ECOS is really the, the, the software that does everything. Uh, and you launch it from KSTARS. So, but KSTARS is a planetarium program. So it, it should be the other way around, I think, but whatever. It's uh, ECOS slash KSTARS and it's great. Um, yeah. So now what, pl uh, what, what platform are you using? Are you using, an, are you using a Macintosh, Windows, are you using Linux? What do you prefer? Uh, Linux. So, okay. So, so when I do astrophotography, I don't want to have my laptop sitting out there because a, it sucks a lot of power from uh, what, well, at home, it's not a big problem, but if you go to the Sierras, it is a problem because you only have a battery and it just sucks it empty just like that. So I, I use a Raspberry Pi and um, that one, the one that I have is a Pi 2B. It runs um, uh, Raspbian, which is a, a um, What's the basic Debian? It's a Debian clone, and Debian is kind of nice. It's a lightweight 
form of Linux. And I think it only uses one or two watt. Uh, I, I can run it from, from my one watt port actually. So that's pretty good. Um, yeah, and so then I uh, remote uh, connects to it. Uh, I used to do it from my laptop, but then I was in the Sierras one time and I, my, my, my keyboard froze up. So <laughs> there so, was. So with Raspberry Pi, you need to have, you have to have a, a, a special, um, you know, commands that you use, like for like Linux. I'm not really good at Linux because I don't no, understand it, commands. ECOS is just a user interface. It's, it, it, you don't need a command line at all. So okay. if you set it up, you, you will have to, well, you just follow the instructions. It, it was actually very smooth. When I installed ECOS, I just followed the instructions from their website and no problem at all. It ran. So okay. I, that was, I, was, I was amazed. I mean, that never happens. <laughs> What's well, that's story? a good way to go. What type yeah. of storage do you use uh, uh, with your Raspberry Pi? A 16 oh. gig? Um, I, this, well, I just have a Sandisk, Sandisk 30, 32 gig or something like that, but I don't know exactly how much memory it has. So the real test, I mean, right now I'm using a DSLR. So that's a self-contained thing that doesn't use any storage or, or, or it doesn't okay, have- Okay, you store it on the no. DSLR, oh, okay. So I just use it for auto guiding and for, for, for go-to alignment and that kind of stuff. But talking, once I get a, an astro camera, it's a different story because then you need to stream. You know, there's a whole. You just you just. Yeah, but you do have to have a monitor and uh, keyboard so, when yeah. you set it up. So I, I run a VNC server on my Pi, so I can from inside the house I can just uh, VNC into it and got my desk virtual desktop, and so oh, okay. uh, I, I can start the calibration for the PhD auto guiding or for the. I, actually, I lose use the ECOS auto guider. So, but yeah, I can keep an eye on things just, you know, once in a, once every half hour, I would take a, like to take a look at the errors and that kind of stuff. Yeah, here's the, here's the Raspberry Pi. I just out of the box, I haven't set it up yet or anything. It's not, it's a tiny little thing, but this is the latest one. I think it's the Pi 4. Pi 4B, how much memory? 4 gig? Uh, 8 gigs now. 8, oh, eight, gigs. eight gigs that, that's like I, a, Cost yeah, you over hundred bucks. That's the sixty dollar one, I think, is it or something? Like that. Yeah, this this yeah. was a hundred with the um, with the accessories. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the the biggest SD card. I think it might be sixty four gigs yeah. and that, and just you know you got a million ports here and everything. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway, these are I've played around with these before, but um, they're they're very cool. Um, in terms of that operating system, looking online too, there's a. Uh, they actually made one called Astroberry instead of the the the, the Raspbian or whatever. For you know, they have all the different yeah. operating systems, but they made one specifically for astrophotography. So yeah. I was going to well, look just check out the ECOS website because if you if you just install that, then you've got basically the equivalent of what they call the AC Pro or something like that. The ZW Air, AC Air. Do you know that product? They sell uh, it commercially. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, but I mean that's. If you get that, you pay all that money, and then you don't you don't use a Raspberry Pi. I mean, this is the the way to do well, the yourself way, I guess. So. What I did here is that if you use that, I mean that 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 product is based on ECOS and K stars, but apparently yeah. it has fewer features. So if you just download, if you just install uh, just a plain Raspberry Pi, go to the ECOS website and install that. You don't have to need to do Raspberry uh, uh, Astroberry or something. I don't know exactly what Astroberry is. I presume it's based on on Indy and Ecos and, and some more things maybe. Oh, it's just it's it's just another uh, implementation of the operating system. Like you know, they have Ubuntu and you're saying Debian or whatever. It's just it's another one. Somebody wrote the operating system. They adapted it specifically towards astrophotography. So it's like yeah. that's all it's really supposed to do. But I mean, you still have the graphical interface, and and I think you can run all those things, the Ecos and and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I I'm just speaking from having watched some videos. I haven't used it or anything, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, e e ECOS is the thing to focus on. Just get the best implementation. So that's why I'm saying just go to the ECOS website because that gives you probably the yeah. best, most reliable. And and they also have a, a message board. So if there are problems, you can file it there and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So and ECOS I was is big. Thinking, I mean, sorry, you go ahead. I, I was thinking we could show our, the um, Jupiter Saturn conjunction photos that people sent in. You have one right behind you, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the close one I got. <laughs> that, that that photo is from the New York Post, uh, uh, and people are commenting on that and saying, you know, all sorts of things. I guess uh, 
Trump brought people together. He, he's bringing planets together as well. So <laughs> they, they, they look as big as the moon. You know, I, I have to say, I haven't been out since last March when all this COVID started. I haven't been out at all. And I contacted Chuck last night and I was telling him that one spot in my yard, I, I was, you know, when I, my wife went up to the top of the hill, tried to see, uh, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, because we live kind of in a canyon. But oddly, just up the steps from the patio, I could just see a little V in the hills next to us with some trees on either side. And there they were for only about 10 minutes. But, it, you know, I, had, I wouldn't have made it if I tried to set up. And plus, it would have been kind of hard putting a tripod on stairs. <laughs> yeah. We've gone to the beach. Let's see. What do we got here? I'll, I'll share some photos that people sent in. See if we're, where can I do that? Yeah, that's why I'm here. I wanted to see what you guys did. I'm, it's, it's, uh, I, you know, I, the only thing I did was look through binoculars and it was a little bit of a flare, but it sure looked, uh, well, it was better than what Mike had, that's for sure. So, what do we got here? So, this is, uh, oh, this is one actually I took on, on the 20th, on Sunday night, I guess. I was practicing that, and so you can just barely see Saturn, Jupiter, you can see the stripes on Jupiter. So that was one shot. So did, did any of you guys see the what looked like to be the fifth moon? Yeah, that's a star. No, I know. Yeah, we we guys were yeah. down in Orange County, and we we uh, uh we were, there was some like they sent me a text, and we're going back and forth. What is this? And I thought I can just go to Stellarium and figure out what it is, but that yeah, it was yeah, about. It goes on a lot of um, observatory programs. Yeah, it was about a seven and a half magnitude star. Yeah, so. Exactly. But it lined up right next to Ganymede. It looked like I go, what what the heck yeah, is this? It was right in line. It looked very suggestive. Yeah. yeah. It a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. What else you got, Tom? Yeah, I'm trying to think other ones that I got. Let's see. So here's a blown out one. Let's see. Share that one. So that's a, a one second exposure at ISO 400. And you can start seeing the, seeing the moons, of course. And this was yesterday, Ganymede is on top of Jupiter. So you can't see Ganymede. That's a star in the middle there. And Saturn just tightened. There's, I think there is another moon right here. Rhea is right uh -huh. there. But Did you... everything's kind of blown yep. out. Is that yours? Yeah, that's mine. Yeah. That's nice, yeah. Did you get my annotated one? I did. I think I, yeah, I think I do. I got it. Yeah, I'll I did too. I'll get it out there in a little bit. I actually really enjoyed that because I didn't realize you could catch so many uh, moons of Saturn. They were all they were over about, the place. I think they were uh, within six arc minutes of each other last night. I think that's what it was. I would know. It was. Uh, it was like London fog here. <laughs> See, what is did, did you guys get the email from Joe Doyle? No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, it was there was a uh, somebody in Oregon sent him a uh, an email about here's here's the conjunction and it was just <laughs> clouds, wall to wall clouds. This is a stellarium showing the think. different <laughs> different objects out there. So Rhea was a close moon here. Yeah. I don't know why they're showing Hyperion. They don't even have a dot for Hyperion. But, so I could only pick up Rhea and Titan with the one second, even a four second exposure. I think I only could pick up those two moons. This Again, is an exposure. Uh, this this is Stellarium. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just to show names, and oh shoot, I wanted to throw, get rid of that. Close that out. And let's see. I don't like that one. Let's see my other pictures here if I can find them. Which one's which? I don't know. There's another one where Saturn, you can see the rings of Saturn, but you can only make out Titan. So and this is this was one fifth of a second at ISO 400. 
Nothing new there. How was the scene last night for you? It was good. It's earlier the better. Like 5.15 yeah. was better than later for me. Mm -hmm. um, out in front of my house. Did the, did the image look kind of flared at all? I mean, when I looked through binoculars, it was really flared. Well, it did, there, a lot it, of clouds came over here later on. Uh, mm -hmm. And that made things look flary. Yeah, it got, it got really humid. I didn't mean to share that one again, I don't think. That was one fifth of a second. This is not an exposure. This is that solarium again. No, that was that was mine. That one. No, that wasn't. <laughs> nope. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I see. You know what? It wasn't indicating which which photo is being shown there. So so yeah, you're seeing the stellarium layout. So trying I was trying to show the uh, arc minutes yeah. that stellarium has on there. You see my mouse on top of it now? No, there, not it's sure. not. I, it's I not stopped the share. Everybody probably. on Facebook, on uh, Zoom, I don't see anything shared. Yeah, I, I, I there, that way. Yeah. Okay, here we go. I think that's a whole oh, screen I'm that's sharing. That's solarium. Now. It's solarium again. Right, right. So is it, I can see the difference up here. Forty-two minutes versus forty-eight minutes. Uh, difference uh, at least horizontally so six maybe seven arc minutes where this when this was uh, mm -hmm. whatever time this was I'm not sure it's not showing the time on this one yeah it was six point something six point three or something I think they said was was that the closest was six something yeah yeah okay I'm thinking six point two four but it might have been six point three nine I, I just heard it somewhere <laughs> Okay, and let me see, go to other people's photos. Let's see, Jerry got you somewhere. Okay, I got Jerry's up just a second. And see if I can, this must be this one here. So you can see Jerry's collection of dots here. Mm -hmm. I guess we can go to actual size and bring it down. Let's see, does this stat show, show the uh, the time? It said two second exposure, ISO 1000. That's right. What, what camera were you using, Jerry? A Canon, a DSLR, a Canon 70D. It's written there on the side. Uh, that's right, yeah. Did you optically bring in Saturn closer there or? What do you mean optically? I mean like post-processing, it looks like it's too close there. No, this is a, this is a single frame snapped as it appeared in the telescope. Oh, wow, okay. It is closer than the other one because you have Ganymede here that's not over the disk of, of Jupiter. Oh, you're saying this is Ganymede? No. Out by the edge. Where's, where's, where's Ganymede, where? no, that's the farthest one out is Callisto. Yeah. Right there. And, uh, yeah, and then down in is Io. And then and Europa. Then, yeah, if that's Europa, then Ganymede is right on the disk. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, and that's a star there. Yeah. But yeah, you can, you can see Rhea and, and Jupiter. Titan. I mean, what's the Titan. one at the bottom? Is that also a star? That's a star. Yeah. It's, okay. You see it's out of line. Okay. But you can see how Saturn, you can't see the rings anymore. No, it's I hard to get to the moons. Hard to find a balance. Oh, there is no balance. You have to uh, take them. You can't take them in the same frame with the same exposure and the same ISO. That's right. Dynamic range is too much. Yeah. And that's your moon shot. Yeah, just before the X showed up, I guess, according to Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Chuck. Just uh, email me. That's one of my favorite things, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't get out. I had a really good view of that from uh, my my backyard, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't get out and see it because it was really clear. Yeah, I tried taking a shot of the moon, and turned out when I got looked at it later, it was it was out of focus. It just wasn't sharp. Hmm. Let's see what 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 if we go actual size here. It's Purbach and. 
Alphonsus? No, the, the two the two craters is Purbach and Werner. The Wer Werner, Werner and Purbach. Did you say that, Jerry? That, that's them right there. I took this picture, yeah. Very nice. Almost, almost straight up last night. Yeah, so did, it, um, did you uh, use video or just is this just a single no, shot? No, this is a single shot um, exposure with my Canon DSLR. It was at 125th of a second on an okay. ISO of about a thousand. And what scope? Um, it's a, um, uh, a 152 millimeter F9 refractor. Oh, okay. Nice. It's a Mead refractor. It's a very oh. good, I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've taken the moon with an apple and I, I get this, this yellow rim around the edges. <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of that. That's Maybe not good. Is, no. the yeah, is, rim, is the yellow rim all around? Well, I, I'd ha you know, I'd have to try again, um, frankly, because uh, I'm not quite sure if that was with uh, my SX40 Zoom. Yeah. I thought I, it was I, supposed uh, to, with the uh, with chromatic uh, refractor, it's supposed to be violet, and not yellow. Yeah, yeah, usually it's a yellow, uh, violet haze around it. You see the rim yeah. here is kind of reddish down on the bottom. Yeah. See that? And look at the top. You see it's kind of bluish. Atmospheric mm. refraction. Yeah, that's atmospheric refraction. Oh, okay. That's okay, not that... the refractor that's doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh I was wondering if, if I was wondering about that in my photos. It would photos. be a purple haze all the way around. Okay. Jerry, okay. I, I was one, wondering about that with my pictures. I was getting red on one side and blue on the other side of Jupiter. I was wondering yeah. what was causing that. That's the atmosphere. The program... It's very low in the atmosphere. Some of, the, some of the programs allows you to shift the uh, yeah. color palettes. You can buy a, uh, a, a prism that changes its um, prismatic strength to counteract that visually in the telescope before you shoot, or you can go to the programs. Uh, uh, Photoshop will do it. You separate the color channels and you displace them so they overlie again, and then you put them back together and it gets rid of that atmospheric refraction. Hmm. Some of the planetary stacking that. software does it too. Yeah. Would that work for Hank? Sure. Um, it yeah, I do it. It's been a very long time since I tried that because I'm not a planetary person, actually. Um, yeah. But now that I'm waiting, you know, I'm still waiting for my 12 inch newt. But once I get that thing, I will definitely take a shot at the planet. Here in this picture, you can see one side is red and the other side is blue or blue green yeah. on Jupiter. Yeah. That's classic atmospheric refraction. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, from the 20th, I think, that I took this. Uh -huh. And then, um, let's see if we got another one here. Um, trying to find the one from last night. This one was on the astrophotography um, website. That I thought it was pretty, pretty cool. They, uh, that, it, that's a composite picture. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They, they, did, they did some manipulation. Yeah. Yeah. They just took the blurry image out and pasted in the, the, in the sharp image. Well, and this is from that two nights ago where he had that star. Yeah. All right. Danny yes. there. But uh, yeah, no, they, they, uh, but I, it, it was post process, you know, with multiple images stacked and then they, you know, do some masking to bring the moons out brighter and everything. So yeah. I was just trying to learn how to do that today. And then uh, let's see. It's the one thing my uh, pictures I didn't do. I didn't do any sharpening. Now this is the one I got last night, which is uh, I was trying to get it so I could just get some definition in Jupiter, but then you get get really faint on Saturn. So. Um, oh, there you got some nice bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. You know, I took this image today, and in PixInsight, uh, playing around with this, um, the moons are actually in this. You can't see yeah. that, but if I mask this out, I'm going to mask this, then I'm going to, you know, increase the luminance and everything of, of the other things and, and bring out, I don't think I'll get Titan or, you know, maybe I will, I don't know, but I, I saw I can get like, I think three of the moons, maybe four of the moons here. So I'm going to play around and process this, and you know, and yeah. sharpen it up. You know, this is get it get it a little bit sharper. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, that was it's kind yeah, of fun.
Thanks. Tom, Tom, I sent you. I sent you a link of uh, a guy named Damian Peach um, from the. Uh, I got it from the Sky Searchers, and he he's got a pretty nice one. Combine multiple. Did, did you get that my link? So who'd who'd you send it to? In the chat room, I think. Hey, Adrian. Oh, there it is. Okay. Hey, Adrian. Hey, guys. How's Caltech? Hey. Oh, hi. Hey, good. Yeah, I'm actually back home. I thought I'd drop in. Yeah. Hi, Chuck. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. So I'm going to share yeah, that. Time. Share that Damien's peach. Uh, let's see if I can find that. We were thinking about you guys last night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were out there. Gosh darn it. Where is that at here? An another really good planetary guy is. Um, Christopher Go. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's amazing what uh, zero latitude and a 14 inch STP. <laughs> That's a pretty so, good one. If you zoom so, in, you can actually see the the red spot and stuff. So it says oh, it yeah. didn't composite, but it's uh, I think it was uh, probably just multiple exposures. Uh, you so, know, I got hints of the red spot. In in my images, I didn't know if that was oh. a, a dust yeah. bunny or not. Well, this was this was Sunday night because of the configuration of the moons. Yeah, and you can That's see that extra star there, HD yeah. one nine whatever. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy the red spot while you can. It's only got about seventy thousand more years. They say that it's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To, to, to get something like this, you have to have different exposures for Jupiter and for Saturn, obviously, because you yeah. know Jupiter will be one big white ball. So. I, I was thinking about somehow rigging up an occulting disk. Yeah, that's yeah. Rig, rigging up what? An occulting disk to put over like Jupiter and Saturn. So you get oh yeah, there. yeah. So, so this is Mike's imagery here huh yeah so on different moons so this again this was sunday night uh, layout yes. huh? yeah it was yeah it, you know when it's this low to the horizon it's really hard to tell if you're really focused or not too huh but you've got a record of them being close together yeah so so what did you do you 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 took those little squares and you um i took different them exposures. separately right? the, yeah. that's uh three different images three different exposures uh, oh okay because okay. i couldn't get the uh I, I couldn't get saturn properly with jupiter it's so much more in dynamic range mm -hmm. so uh, yeah neat so actually the the, the large moons are kind of blown out in the way. Yeah. 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 Oh, I don't understand. You you, you have to take different exposures, uh, yes. different yeah. different Im images. So what do you do? Do you paste it in one into, are you doing it in layers when you, when Basically you- Basically uh, what I did was I got uh, three JPEGs, pasted them in. I, I like using Vizio. I pasted the big one in Vizio and snipped and, and brought the other ones in and basically cropped them and plunked them on top, you know? That's what I did. I, I'm, I'm not a uh, Photoshop guy. So I just, I just, you know, they're the same, the same so, telescope, the same size, just different uh, exposures. So, so how did Damien Peach do this one? He, he, he laid things on top of each other or what? Oh yeah, I'm, well, I'm, the only information I'm that I have is as a, it's a combination of several exposures to reveal the moons of both planets. So I think mm -hmm. he probably took the exposures of different lengths and just uh, individually co copied and pasted, or just you know you you, you can make overlays. I like uh, for instance, if you have GIMP, then you can uh, you know you have layers. And you, if you put one exposure in one layer, then you can just decide which one you're going to show at the front. You know, it, it all blends together. You can enhance them and, and pick the best of each or whatever you want to do. 
You can put oh, coins in one layer and show the other one through it. There's a, there's a technique yeah. where you can use one exposure to make a mask. Um, and then it, right. the mask will either block or let something through. So and you then, can. So, so you these can, objects are well separated. So it's not too difficult. Of the planet, and then you can block the bad picture from getting through. So what you can do in GIMP, for instance, is you, you would pick Saturn and uh, put a white blob around that and then uh, do a Gaussian blur. So it, it, you get a smooth transition. And that would give you a mask for, yeah. for, for Saturn. And then do you do one minus that mask. So you can do pixel math. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's for the background. So you can then multiply those layers with the parts that you selected or deselected and, and then do all kinds of things with it. So it's, it's, and then you get smooth transitions if you do it right. Yeah, so, if you can put Mike Chibnick's back up there that showed where he had pasted on in a crude way. Yeah, because yeah. that's the, the only no way I know. <laughs> you what? <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's, yeah, but you're, you're first step, you're there. You're getting yeah. there. Yeah. Can you put that back up, Tom? Yeah, just just a second. I gotta okay. Get back there. Time's up. Do, do, do. And I gotta share screen. Yes, now you see what he's done. He's taken a picture that has sharp resolution, but was a lower exposure, and he's directly put it over in the right place to cover up the out of focus one. Mm -hmm. And then you can, the next step is to do a very good job better than he's done. He didn't attempt it, but to blend those two things in. So you can't see the square stuff and to make the background darkness the same. And then you do the, what uh, Hank said, the Gaussian blur, for example, to merge the two together. And when it's, it's easy to do so that you can't really tell on quick look that it has been um, processed that way. I think one way to go, you take a, a big a big section of the of the plain background, and then copy that and paste it over the fuzzy Jupiter, and then paste mm -hmm. the, the the good Jupiter on top of that same kind of background. That's that's kind of what I did, and I made some uh, GIFs that I just sent off to Ed Hat. That's why I was late yeah. getting on here. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, and I've got. I look forward here. to seeing them. I, I can put them up here. Um, let's see. I've got to get back to here. And unfortunately, they're in separate windows, but here is the uh, here's Monday night. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I was, I was, I was photographing over, you know, a road with hot pavement and a slate roof after the seventy-nine degree temperatures of the day. Uh huh. Um, so you can see how Jupiter's kind of wobbly. Mm -hmm. Saturn was really distorted in some of them. It, almost double images in some. But I, but yeah, you're right. It was, it was two different images. One where Saturn and Jupiter were reasonable a really yeah. short exposure and then a much longer one to bring out the dimmer things mm -hmm. thinking about temperature it's been about in the 40s here a little cooler <laughs> so you're doing layers you're do, you're, put, you're putting in the the picture of saturn and jupiter and then you do right. the i i did a i did a, a baseline layer that had just jupiter and saturn in it and then I pasted in an upper layer that had the moons. And then I went to the, the moon, the, the topmost picture and did an erase until, until um, you know, I, I changed the um, opacity a little bit and then erased the, the overexposed Jupiter, put in the rightly exposed Jupiter and Saturn, and then did the clone tool to kind of smush sky in over the brightened, you know, the bright aura that was around yes, them. Yeah. That clone tool is cool. <laughs> oh, so that false color is due to you, not the atmosphere. Uh, well, just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. There's the, if you, in the original, I can see a big mush mashed 
area around Jupiter where I didn't do it very yeah. well. But uh, in the size that goes to Ed Hat, it doesn't really show. No, it's good. It's nice. Yeah. And then here was, yeah, this was Sunday night. And I couldn't get Raya that night. And you can see that it was, the distortion was worse. Mm -hmm. I'll bet if you stretch that with curves, you can get Rhea out of it. I can give it a try. OK, so that's it. Good job. Back to Zoom. <laughs> Stop share. So I got, just in that idea of the masks, uh, let's see if I can pull this up here. Uh, let's see here. It's always, you can bring up Windows. It's hard to figure out where the program is here, though. Uh, program. Yeah, I've got uh, PixInsight running here somewhere. Oh. I'm just trying to figure out where it is here. I don't know why it's not showing. It doesn't show all my windows here. Well, anyway, there's a... Sorry, I'm not sharing. And I'm playing around with Andromeda, too. So this is multiple images, but I don't have enough yet. And just uh, was trying this live stack uh, function in uh, SharpCap, which is kind of nice. So you set all these parameters and everything and histogram how you want to play with it. Mm -hmm. and doing everything, which is kind of cool. So, so still got some more work to do with that. Uh, let's see if I can just bring this guy up. Can you guys see this now? Yeah. So this is, you know, once you have an image, so this one is was stacked in the auto stacker Thing. And so I've got, you know, the real faint uh, Saturn and then Jupiter. And then they have these, this mask builder itself. So I just have some parameters here. So this thing runs its process and we'll build. I'm still mask. seeing Andromeda, just to let you know. Still seeing yeah. Andromeda. Oh, okay. That's what I was wondering. Okay. I'm sorry. I guess it, it didn't switch over. Let me, let me see if I can. Okay. I was waiting for Saturn to emerge. Or just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh... It's right behind Tom. Yeah. Well, for some reason, it's not allowing me to share, share, a, different, share a different window. There right, we go. So there's there some, go. Well, that, that isn't what I was trying to do, but here's the, the video that I was shooting with that ASI 224 of, of Jupiter and Saturn last night at kind of a lower exposure. Oh, it's a video. Yeah, this is a video, so... So they're bouncing around a little bit. Did there. you use an SER or an AVI file? Um, I I set this to AVI file for this one, and then um, then you can feed it into different programs for for stacking and stuff. I right. think I could put it in um, uh, the auto oh, stacker okay. where yeah, and then uh -huh. play around with the settings on that. Well, I can see bands on Jupiter in that on occasion. Yeah, tiny, tiny bit. Once it gets stacked, they, they look better. But uh, it's yeah. not a good year for planets, right? I mean, you, you have to wait a few more years. Too far Except south. Mars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll just I'm gonna with that other one. Does. It, it just it automates a mask. It just it's really nice that you guys were talking about having to use a draw tool with this one. You don't really have to. It just it just encapsulates all uh, you know the bright planets and everything. So anyway, it's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Hey, I've got to ask Adrian uh, what you've been doing in school. Are you always at at home right now, huh? I'm not at home now. Well, right now I am, but in the past couple of terms, I've had a place in Pasadena with some schoolmates. Um, but yeah, no, no in-person classes, certainly no labs, nothing like that. <laughs> um, it's a shame, but we think by next fall, things will be, be back in person. Yeah, I think there's a good chance of that. We'll be back to semi-normal in fall. Yeah. Yeah. It's not so much of a shame for me. I find the online schooling works pretty well, but 
Yeah. I think it's mostly a shame for the incoming freshmen because they miss out on all the social stuff. Uh huh. Um, yeah, I can see that. Pretty good time. So you're not you're not doing any special projects on the side there. Um, let's see any special. Um, over the summer I made a theremin. Uh, <laughs> Tom Whittemore would be interested in that. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, that was so. That was uh, it's really the only side project, and I did some research over the summer too. Um, I've, I'm sorry to admit I'm affected from astronomy now. I'm fully into physics as my major. Okay. <clears throat> At, I went through withdrawal symptoms too. What yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, but I did take out the telescope last night and have a look. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Physics is good too. Yeah, I think I think the research in physics is is more fun than the research in astronomy. I like the amateur astronomy stuff, but atmosphere. I did some research in astronomy. Okay. I wasn't. Have you have you you're, are you part of along that you have a preference for which direction you might go in physics? Condensed matter or plasma? Not, or not, nothing yet. Huh? Yeah, not terribly far along now. Hey, um, we need fusion. Get working on fusion. <laughs> I'll figure that out. Yeah, that would be nice. No, just uh, cosmology. If you want to do cosmology, then physics is probably a better way to start than astronomy. Yeah, and that was always my main interest in astronomy, anyways. So maybe I will. Maybe I will go for that. Okay. But currently, my my thing is. Atomic and molecular physics. That's mm -hmm. the stuff I currently do research in. Yeah. But who knows if, if I'll... not particle, but the the. the I was stuff. focused on astronomy and astrophysics until the, my junior year, when a professor asked me to help him out in the solid state lab. Oh. Okay. And that really got my attention, so that was yeah. what I get my degree in. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. No, they're still doing some really good stuff yeah. with solid state. I think condensed matter now, I think yeah. that's what they call solid state now. It's the, um, something like the most active. What is condensed help. matter, degenerative matter? Like in black yeah. holes? Uh, oh, not so much black holes. It's basically solid state matter. Solid, solid state matter. specifically used to refer to crystals, anything that was in a crystal structure. And that was a true solid. But then these things started coming online that didn't fit in anybody's field, uh, plastics and liquid crystals, mimetic fluids and stuff, things that acted like solids, sort of, and you could vary the math a little bit. And so pretty soon, um, a lot of physics solid state professors were doing research in all these soft physics, what is it, soft condensed matter, they call it. And so they just renamed the field condensed matter. Anything now that feels like a solid is in there. So it used to be the glass wasn't in solid state, but now it is, so. A lot of the current condensed matter research at Caltech is focused around what's called topological condensed matter. Yeah. Which is what happens on the edges of, of materials. Yeah, where the three-dimensional symmetry breaks down. Yeah. And the math, it turns out the math of condensed matter physics is actually closest to a lot of the math that you run into in cosmology. So it's not- Yeah, a there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of quantum field theory techniques yeah. are exactly the same. Speaking about matter and all, um, I saw a very interesting uh, video with Feynman talking about water and heat and, and all that. The guy was- uh, uh, Mike, I can just barely hear you. I said, uh, I saw a video of, you know, I'm just trying to this one here without disconnecting everything. Of uh, Feynman, um, it was like an hour and a half and he's talking about all the different subjects. And one of it is uh, about heat and heat transfer and the way that he describes how the matter changes states and all that is very, very uh, well done in non-tech speak. Um, he actually was pretty good about that. Even though he was a Nobel laureate, uh, he actually uh, 
could talk in, uh, you know, regular English, you might say, describing things. And, uh, uh, it, I yeah, he's a good lecturer. It's what? He's a good it, lecturer. Yes, he was. Good speaker. If you ever have time reading that book, uh, surely you must be joking, Mr. Oh, Fox. yeah. It's a great yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. One thing I read that when I first got into the astronomy club, there was somebody recommended. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, recommend, recommended this this article he wrote uh, on there's room enough at the bottom, and it was about the yeah. micro putting everything in smaller and smaller yeah. uh, th things. He's, he was saying he could get the entire encyclo Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin, and uh, it, what was phenomenal about it is he wrote it in 1950. And, and then he showed exactly how he did it. I mean, how he would do it. So I don't know what what part of whatever happened to that, the, the micro technology that, that was really going uh, great guns for a while there. And it's just kind of disappeared. Well, well, it's still know, going. It's, it's, a, it's a whole new field, uh, nanotechnology and uh, yeah. materials. So yeah, they're you, doing a lot out at UCSB on that. Is yeah, there? That's, that's what... Uh, um, Adrian was referring to at Caltech too. Yeah. Oh, the, the nanotechnology. That, that that's, and metamaterials. You can design a system or a technology that you need a certain set of physical parameters like dielectric function or absorption or transmission, uh, but you can't find that material. Nature didn't make a material like that. But it turns out by geometrical construction on a nanoscale basis, you can make materials that have properties that can be tuned to give you the, the material you need. So that's the technology side of it. Feynman could see what the, the, the potential, he understood the physics and it took what, 30, three decades for the technology to catch up. To catch up, yeah, that, that's, that's incredible. And I, unfortunately, I think that's where we're gonna be always. But yeah. uh, th things, things seem to be happening at a, at a faster pace um, I kind of worry a little bit about uh, the cost of it all because, like say, when, when I was in dentistry, the 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 when finally the digital age came into dentistry, what came with it, what I thought was going to be a great benefit to us, but what came with it was was a huge cost of the machines, and with every iteration there was another huge cost. So you could you just couldn't keep up with the cost of it all. So the pace was really fast but the cost was huge. So the two didn't kind of match. It just, it was, it was something there. I wish they would do something like say, okay, if you've invested this much money in, in this, in this nanotechnology and it, and it morphs into something completely different. You don't just throw the whole thing out. I think they should be allowed to kind of gracefully move over into the newer technology without losing your butt. And that's, it, it, that's what happened in dentistry. It's just terrible. So if it, if it, in physics, I don't know what that would, what that would be, but well, you're talking but, technology. Yeah. That's a different ball game. Yeah. The, if, as far as like just a pencil and paper, that's great. I mean, you're, you're, you've got all you need there, but, but uh, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to where you're bu actually building the machines as it morphs and goes into, into another phase, I don't know what they're throwing out. You know, they're just throwing, billions of dollars away and uh I, I, there's got to be a way of kind of gracefully moving from one technology to another without losing so much that's all i'm saying is it's it's it, it bothered me greatly in, in dentistry that we could never you know for a mom and pop shop like karen and i we could uh, never keep up with that and nobody would nobody have plenty would of this older technology What's that? Nobody Chuck? wanted the older. Yeah, they did. As a matter of fact, it's turning out now that I have guys still calling me saying, you know, come on back and there's nobody doing what you did. And it's, it still works. It works great as far as I'm concerned, but the newer technologies, they'll get there. You know, they're, they're, it's just a matter of, there's certain things that in, in dentistry anyway, that I don't like with the, with the new technology. They have to create uh, special preparations of, in the teeth. And 
to to uh, to adequately uh, utilize all the different materials that, that are out there now. And some of them, I think they're harmful to your teeth. Your teeth are made with just certain layers, you know, your dent, your enamel, dentin, and then you go into the, the pulp. And I, I think some of these, te these, these technologies now, I think there's a, a gross reduction of some of the teeth more than there should be. So it, 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 it's, I don't know how, I, I want to get back to where we were with the, with the physics, how that re relates to physics. But I know in dentistry, I didn't care for it, but I always felt that it was going to catch up, that the, that the technology was going to, it was going to work. It was just a matter of time. So with, with, with nanotechnology, I, I love it. I mean, the, the phone, who wouldn't, I looked at Karen the other day and I said, are you kidding me? If I would have told you that I'd be wearing a, a Fitbit watch, you know, 30 years from now, carrying an iPhone, talking to you from on the road and through the, the car speaker, would you have believed me? And, and I think everyone would say, no, not really, you know, but, but it happened. And your, and, your Apple phones, uh, Dick Tracy. Yeah. Dick Tracy. So you Dick, didn't Tracy, believe your Dick Tracy comic in 1950. Yeah. Yeah, and it took that long, Jerry. I mean, it, it just it, just like you said, it just took that long for for the ideas that you, you got, you physicists have. It's another thirty years to catch up to you. <laughs> it's got to be really a little frustrating. So, and anyway, that's my two cents. So here we are in a pandemic, waiting to get back together. <laughs> yeah. Probably about yeah. six months. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I think I think it'll happen. I don't like the idea of the new strain out there, but I, I think uh, they'll figure it out. They'll figure you know it that out. That they, like all things, the virus is mutating all over the place. There's there's a whole bunch of new mutations. I don't know yeah. why one- You just need to get to it before it mutates. What's that? <laughs> yeah. <much? laughs> there's no yeah. evidence that it's more contagious or anything. And the vaccine covers them all so far. So far. This new one is a is a mutation to the spike protein, and that's what they're targeting with the mRNA vaccine. So, it's a little bit uh, okay worrisome. Well, the mom targets that. Kaiser called up my mom to tell her to get her vaccination. Of course, she's ninety six. By the way, going, I I did some looking up online, and I thought it was kind of interesting if what the weight of a single, I don't know if I told you guys this last week, the weight of a single virus particle is, and then the, the um, total number that are in an infected person, and they say it's about 70 billion, I forget, cells per whatever. But anyway, then you add this all up, and then the number of infected people, and at that time, I think it was just infected people, they've been in the US. But anyway, I thought, what is the weight, you know, or the mass of that? But So it, uh, the, their, their units were in mass. By the time I looked it up, which was just a couple of weeks ago, was uh, one and a half grams. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh yeah, that's a little scary. That's a little scary. So one and a half grams of the virus is is you know what what had infected everybody, and that's that's kind of a little bit on the low count because uh, you know you're just saying this is the amount they have when you register as being infected, and then it goes up a lot higher than that. But I, I in my mind I was thinking I bet it's less than a pound. You know, I bet it's less less than a pound of this stuff. You know, so anyway, that, that just blew me away. One and a half grams. No, gram. <laughs> yeah, it's, gram. Like, it's like comet tails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I saw a very nice meteor last night while I was photographing the um, Jupiter and Saturn. Me too. Two of them. One one while it was still blue sky too. Oh no, mine was in a darker sky, but it was going straight down off to the left of Jupiter and Saturn. It was a bright one too. With a, it came down and then it flared out and then it died away real quick. Did greenish, Jerry? Was it greenish? It was more whitish. There were some colors, faint hues in it, but yeah, it was saturating my uh, rods or cones or whichever one looks at white. <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably the, probably the cones. Yeah. So, so Jerry, I have a question about using raw on the DSLR, how, how big of a difference would that make compared to a JPEG of this, say, Jupiter or Saturn? JPEG loses a lot of information. Yeah, you don't want to go with just JPEG, yeah. 
Just well, but for, for, planets, it does, for planets, it doesn't matter because the resolution is so bad that you may as well use JPEG. And you know, if you do an AVI and you stack them, that's also very low resolution. I mean, a lot of these when images- When you do RAW in a DSLR camera, it's not really RAW. They have um, not like a CCD RAW. They do some processing in it that they don't uh, tell you about. You know, what, you, you know what though, I was looking that up at least with my Canon, that's true if you just use the camera alone, but if you can, if you collect the images through the cable from the camera to your computer, you actually get a higher resolution and it doesn't do that processing. You actually get, uh, you know, uh, um, more, more pixels per image. It's, I haven't tried doing this yet, but I, I thought, wow, that's kind of bizarre. But yeah, it's even the raw is, is reducing it a little bit, at least in the so camera. You mean as the, as the camera generates or senses the picture, it stores it on the computer in addition to storing it on the camera? If you use the external port, it, it will have a higher resolution than if you just let it store to the SD flash card. Yeah, which is, and I haven't played around with it, but I thought, wow, that's that's kind of amazing. So, I've, I've never heard that before. I'll look into it. So yeah, it's not yeah. video. It's it's the it's individual images. Yeah, yeah. When you do, with mine, when you do individual, one of the choices you can do is I do JPEG and RAW. It does both images at the same time. That's what I do. Well, I yeah. I yeah I do Canon RAW. Me too. It's not real RAW. Yeah, it's CR two. No real yeah. RAW on a Canon camera. Yeah. When you guys when you guys are shooting uh, images like last night, Jupiter, the planets or the moon, does it make a difference whether your camera has the 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 mirror or or is it best just to look for something that's mirrorless or look into your camera to, to I think there's a mirror lock. I have my camera preset, so when I when I press the uh, manually press the shutter, uh, the mirror flips up and then it stays there, and I usually count to five or six, and then I hit the button that opens the shutter. And then the mirror comes down again. Is it a remote? Uh, is it a remote button? I have a little remote thing on it. Yeah, that I a, a cable that fires the camera controls. Now, the camera. now, had you connected it up to a cable, okay, and use something like Backyard EOS, you would have been able to use the live view feature of the Canon camera. Yeah, I do take, use that live view to take the uh, take the videos on the computer. I, I use the live view just to frame it and focus because it gives yeah, but me a for planetary view for focusing. But and for planetary, I, I, I don't record the images on the computer. I didn't have a computer hooked up last night. Hmm. But sometimes I run the entire DSLR from several hundred feet away over a yeah. Ethernet cable. Yeah, I have a Fuji, and um, it's a better camera than the Canon, I think, but. And it's, it's also mirrorless, by the way, which is nice. The nice thing about the mirrorless cameras is that they're light. Uh, the Fuji is a very light light camera, actually, and, and you don't also have all these uh, clicks either. I understand so Sony makes a really good one. Yeah, but I, 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 I don't have the, 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 the interface for uh, Backyard EOS. So I, I do have Backyard EOS, and I also have a bunch of Canon cameras. But for astronomy, I, I use my Fujis. Oh, and a lot of the camera manufacturers are now switching to all mirror, mirrorless, mirrorless uh, system cameras. Canon, oh, I bet. Nikon, yeah, they're all moving that way. So it's just Get a matter rid of, of mechanical. Yeah. yeah. Mechanical wrong. Wrong. I, got little, I got my little, I, I got my little iPhone thing from Teleview. It's kind of a pain to set up, but once you get it set up, you can just tap the phone about a million times. I don't know if there's a, re a remote for it, but you can shoot a million of them. And <laughs> and well, actually, actually, I had a friend that uh, used something like that with uh, with his phone to take images similar to what you guys did with the uh, the conjunction. And he actually got pretty good uh, planetary exposures out of it. The yeah. trouble is the newer <laughs> iPhones have, what, three apertures? They they oh, do. Yeah. Got to figure out which uh, one. You just use one. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. yeah, you've got a center. You, you actually the, the the pain with these things is there's a uh, this these little gizmos in the back. These little ears. You have to move them around, and then it connects to the to the different Teleview eyepieces here. And then there's adapters that go on there. But I mean, you have to literally take one eyepiece is going to work for what you're doing, and then center it. But with the new iPhones, Chuck, you would be a pain. That would be a no, no, you just put it over the normal lens. 
one of you people had a camera set up or a set up at one of the outreaches before the COVID hit and we're putting people's iPhones or phones yeah. Yeah. on something. And I got contacted about a week ago by a woman who uh, was trying to find, figure out what brand name that was and stuff. Okay. So I guessed that it was the Teleview one. No, it was Orion. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's dirt yeah, cheap. The, 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 the Teleview one's expensive and it only really works with the Teleview eyepieces. It's not really yeah. that great. The one okay. Chuck had was way Well, better. I gave her the Orion reference also, so she could okay. do her own shopping. Yeah. Yeah, the, the beauty of the one Chuck uses is you can just take everybody's iPhone and pop them in. This thing, I mean, you have to sit there and fiddle, fiddle around with these little ears here and then tighten the, 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 the knob here. You have to tighten the knob and that locks your phone in. But then once you get it locked in, that's not good enough. You have to center the, the camera lens. It was the one that Chuck has, you just literally just open it up. It's in there and you're going. I'm guessing that a remote for your thing there, Tim, would be a stick. Yeah, a stick. Because that's good by me. I, I like it. I, I'm a firm believer in simplicity. <laughs> so, Mike, Mike Chipnick, uh, yeah. did you do a, a special presentation for your Windy Observatory group? Yeah, I could kind of give you a short one. Sure. Yeah, sure. Let me what the heck? Bring it up. Uh, let me. Let me try this one first, and then we got we got twenty minutes left, I guess. Oh, I so. can do that. Yeah, I may have to leave a little bit early, guys, but I'm going to stick around for a little bit of mics. But I oh. may have to check out early. Okay, hold a second. Uh, By the way, just while he's setting that up, you guys were talking about cameras. Um, Can Canon has the EOS RA too. It's specifically made for astrophotography. And Tony Hallis really likes it. Yeah, that that astro backyard guy today. on YouTube uses it all the time. And I, I guess it's a, it, you know, it's pretty pretty pricey, but uh, supposed to be pretty good. Isn't there about twenty four hundred bucks? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. What, made what, one before called a Canon sixty D A. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then a twenty D A a long time ago, and I had one of those, and I donated it to to the museum observatory. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Bought a used one. I got the 60D. It's the uh, the uh, Rebel T3i is the one I use. The Canon 6D is actually a really good camera, and I've I've seen them on uh, eBay for like two hundred dollars or something like that. That's a pro camera, so it's got a really large. So you have to have a focus so they can support that. But if you do that and you actually remove the IR filter, it's a really really good camera. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just Tony, thinking about Tony. That. Tony says with the new uh, RA cameras because of the short uh body uh shallow you have to put an adapter there but they make adapters now where you can put filters in there he says you can put two inch filters to put different things in there and he says like with the oxygen filter he says he's getting very good pictures with that just yeah, so yeah, it. yeah they have this whole snap in filters i bought no one. no this is just regular oh. filters you can slide in because of the fact that you have that much that you have to adapt for from the old Canon lenses. So they made an adapter with the slide in there. Um, hey, do you Mike, want me to hey, go? Mike, excuse me. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to check out. I really have, I'm I'm very sorry to do that. I wanted to okay. see your uh, I wanted to see that. But you guys all have a Merry Christmas, okay? You too. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, right, Adrian, Adrian, it's really nice seeing you. Tim, you can see it later on video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Video okay. Later. Uh, can everybody see my uh... yes, I can yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, let me just go through the first couple of slides. This is what I show my people. Okay. Chaos and this and uh, uh, on the superhighway of the solar system. I don't know if you read that article last week. That was a hot topic. You know where they talked yeah. about. Well, hey, things can really move fast in the uh, solar system with this new superhighway they discovered. And I started digging into it, and uh, it's not exactly uh, going at the light of speed, guys. Um, so uh, this is this is this is the thing that uh, people, everybody read. You know, astronomers just found cosmic superhighways for fast travel through the solar system. 
Define fast travel. 10,000 years, 5,000 years, that's what they considered fast, okay? Not sort of like uh, Buzz Lightyear type speed. So um, basically uh, what you found in the article, they, they talk about things called space manifolds, which when you really think about it is sort of a tendency for things to be dragged around gravitationally. Um, in, in the solar system by, you know, the sun and, and the major planets. And so they're talking about spacecraft, ma navigation and all that. Basically what it's doing is it's not totally a free ride. It's sort of like it helps make things go faster, but it's, it's not going to take things in three weeks. It's, think of the Voyagers going probably about five times faster. So, um, you know, I started digging around in here and they talk about chaos. And so, you know, you go take a look at how our solar system developed, you know, it was totally chaotic in the beginning. You know, we had gas, dust and particles um, swirling around and uh, eventually it started forming less of a chaotic thing where, you know, the sun gets formed and then um, it goes off and then you get that torus of gas and particles where um, in our case uh, we segregated into the inner rocky planets, the outer gaseous planets. And then um, later on, you know, um, with the leftover stuff, we got our asteroids and, and uh, you know, uh, trans-Neptunian and the Oort cloud and all that is kind of left over. So for the most part, our solar system is pretty stable, except for certain- Mike, you've right. faded away. I can't hear your voice. Oh. Okay, I'm just gonna have to talk real close. Okay, so uh, for the most part, our solar system has kind of sorted itself out in a quasi stable uh, thing where things- I can't hear you at all, sorry. Yeah. Mike, you got real weak. Okay, can, can you hear me now? No, it's still not strong. Okay, what about now? <laughs> a little bit better, but... Oh, this is really, really weird because I'm talking into the microphone. Okay. Well, you, you know, want to but... wig, wiggle a wire. Wiggle yeah. a wire. I, I have a feeling, I, I wonder if it has to do with your headphones. I'm, I'm, I'm Zooming with my son as well, and he has the same problems. He's got a headphone. And when he gets too close to the cam uh, to the microphone, it gets worse. And if you go further away, it gets better. I one, bet there's something with it. One, one second. He's in the trans-Neptunian zone. <laughs> Asking one, two, three. Can you hear me now? No, not Maybe. that well. Uh, I, so I I can hear him relatively okay. Can you so. hear me now? It's it's, you know, it's 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 barely acceptable. Oh god. Okay. I think that fan thing is working you know, is taking over the mic or something. I don't yeah, hear the fan, fan right now. My fan is on. Yeah, I hear okay. it kind of low in the background. Yeah, okay. I'm going to go talk real close to the laptop. Got another it's Pretty good now. It's okay. Good. Okay, well that's because my my face is practically on the microphone now. <laughs> right. I can hear you now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We got okay. real close. Okay. So anyways, um, so, uh, you know, uh, one of the things about uh, things like our solar system is it's hard to predict where things move, but we do, we do know things uh, got tossed out. They got sucked into the sun or to the planets. They got captured. And, uh, uh, and we do know that our, our solar system has a lot less objects now than it did before. Um, we've had 4 billion years to, to kind of weed out the, um, all the, all, most of the debris, but we still have a few things coming through. And so uh, one of the things that the articles talked about was uh, uh, the the, the space manifold they talk about is Jupiter is basically the chief player. It has a uh, 
massive impact, uh, no pun intended because of the size of it. And uh, so again, space, I'll go through over here. This is basically what, what they did was they statistically looked at a bunch of orbits and um, of asteroids and planets and comets and they made a model um, using a thing called, uh, where is it now? Oh, a, a, L, um, a fast loop Linapov indicator, which is basically a name for uh, an, an odds maker for uh, gravitational wells. And so what they came up with, if you take a look at here, um, the, the likely paths of objects that will move through the, uh, through the solar system and E is the eccentricity of it. And you can see that there's a couple of places where it's pretty stable. And this is where certain asteroids like the Hilds and the Trojans are. And so uh, basically what they did was they, they, um, the, uh, the fast looping off uh, indicator, they, they basically plugged those in and they got a pretty good correlation. And so uh, there's a, uh, I could bring up this video, but then uh, it'd be a little bit hard to do. So, um, oh geez. Let me go back over here. Okay, so they, they talk about the manifolds, okay. And basically the manifolds are basically wells in the gravitational uh, attractions that happen that cause objects to move about in a certain way. And so um, they're the ones that are uh, uh, responsible for the uh, 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 Jupiter family comets, the centaurs, and the trans-Newtonian -New uh, Neptunian objects. Okay, they they kind of it's sort of like a shepherding type of force or tendency, and so they follow manifolds. And so what I did was I showed my uh, the folks in my club who are not mathematical, what a, a manifold are is basically a manifold is a curve. Uh, it's a, a one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. And then what I did was I explained how this circle is a, uh, a plane that if you bring it through here, okay, through this manifold, which just happens to be a sphere, that you get a dot, you get a circle that expands as you bring it down further and it gets smaller and smaller until it gets to a point and then it becomes uh, 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 nothing on, on this plane, which is what you're looking at the manifold with. And so what I showed uh, uh, the other people was there's different types of manifolds. There's three-dimensional, two-dimensional. And uh, so uh, I kind of explained to them what I'm, the, the manifolds, these here, are basically a slice of a three-dimensional uh, curve that they've been able to calculate. So anyways, again, uh, they're using this thing called the fast line above indicator. And so it's basically like a scoring card or something like that showing showing how they, they looked at what seemed to be a chaos, but they made sense out of the chaos because of this. And so um, they were able to work on um, the transitioning orbits of uh, uh, objects between Uranus and Neptune. And um, the thing is, is that um, uh, they were able to show where things could get kicked out um, relatively quickly over other objects. So um, uh, basically, this is an example of a comet that they, they worked on that they showed that follows uh, the F, uh, um, FLI um, uh, theory, uh, a, um, a, a comet where you can see um, where the, the curve goes up and down the, the orbital parameters of it and happens to be from the 1700s to where they calculate to be the 2200s. So they got data from around here and they, are able to, they were able to 
verify uh, using this uh, uh, this comet here was moving around because of the the, the gravitational uh, forces of Jupiter and the other planets and the Sun, but it kind of followed the the um, the FLI, so that um, they used it. again they were able to verify this is just a cover sheet of the uh, thing where they first described it, and um, a lot of this stuff here, okay, the Trojans and all that, this was kind of like the groundwork of it really was uh, as a result of this guy, uh, LaRange, uh, who basically laid the foundations of what people uh, later used uh, in, uh, uh, for orbital calculations. And of course, he helped uh, refine the orbital calculations. And so one of the things I like showing my club members is the history of where things came from. And so I just happened to, to zero on this guy, the LaRange. Um, he uh, lived in the 1700s, um, uh, 1700s um, to the 1800s. And uh, he was an Italian born French mathematician. And uh, um, he lived in Turin. Um, it was, it's kind of interesting how people like uh, LaRange uh, came to be interested in, into uh, science and astronomy and all that. Um, he was born in Turin uh, to a father that was fairly well off, but lost all his money because he just made bad uh, investments. And so he wound up going to the College of Turin, which is like your local uh, uh, city college to be a lawyer, figuring he could make a lot of money. And then, you know, uh, things got derailed because he read a book and he read Haley's book on, he said, I read, I read Haley's book on uh, use of algebra and optics. And he said, hey, this mathematics is really uh, hot stuff. And so he self-taught himself um, on the mathematics and then started looking at all these you know, there was a lot more unsolved mathematical problems back then. He started solving them and sent it to Euler, who at the time was the most, uh, the world's most renowned uh, uh, mathematician at the time. The guy um, in, in the story, the larger story, he looks at these papers and says, hey, I just, I just solved this, but this guy's pretty good. And he doesn't have a formal education. This guy must be really smart. And so they had a correspondence and became a friendship. And then Euler in 1755 got um, LaRange a uh, professor appointment at the Royal Artillery School in Turin, even though he didn't have a, uh, um, a degree. And so uh, there he taught. And uh, he, he told people, he said, if I'd been rich, I probably would not have devoted myself to mathematics because at the time he was, Studying to be a lawyer, evidently he really didn't want to be, but because his father didn't have money and he had to bring money in and all that. And then that's how he discovered the book. And so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting story how somebody as prominent in mathematics really didn't start out that way. It was almost like an accident. So, um, he, he went on to do a lot of more mathematical stuff, uh, became the founding member of the Academy of Science of Turin. He started working on calculus of probabilities and least kinetic action of energy, which are two things related that uh, Newton talked about. At the time, the calculus was sort of like a Model T, okay? It was, it was something new. It solved a lot of people's problems, but it didn't have a lot of hooks to different things in sciences. And so LaRange and a bunch of other people started adding, adding widgets to the calculus, which is what we now know. Now know if, if you take in calculus, you hear LaRange and other, you know, Leibniz's and, um, and um, other names of equations. Well, these guys were like adding on to the, the calculus, which was I wouldn't say simple, but had a lot less tools to use. And so he, 
he, he started uh, working on differential equations, um, improving on how you do those. And number theories, he came up with some interesting prime numbers of number theories and, of course, the Lorangian functions, which gets us to, uh, okay, astronomical work. Why are we talking about a mathematician with uh, uh, astronomy? Well, at the time, um, during that time, we all remember that um, Messier um, used to make a lot of money off of prizes, discovering things. And this also happened with mathematicians and physicists. They, they would make a lot of money. Uh, um, a lot of their income would be from winning prizes. And so he wound up uh, working on um, explaining the... Uh, the, the uh, phases of the moon. Um, he worked on the orbits of Jupiter. He worked on the three body problem with Euler, um, uh, which is something I don't think that we really have a true um, exact, uh, how would you put it? A solution, an exact solution. We have an exact solution for a one body and two body, but when it gets into three body, I don't think we have an exact solution. We have a, the, it, what you're looking for is calling it a closed, uh, closed yeah. body, yeah, closed, closed form solution. Right. Yeah. They got close. They, they yeah. you know, they, they they made things happen, which when you think about it, the um, three body problem is very important in calculating the orbits. That's what. Uh, um, uh, how, uh, you know, um, um, other people, you know, used to solve, you know, where Neptune and uh, Uranus and, and Pluto was with, um, things that he kind of developed. And also he started stu studying the perturbations of the orbits of the comets by the planets and the stability of the solar system, which is kind of what the L LPI kind of used as a foundation to determine the superhighways in the uh, in the solar system. So um, later in the career, he, um, it's kind of interesting. You have superstars like Lorange. Everybody wanted to have them in their country. He got invited to Germany and he, they, the, the, the Italians wanted them. He wound up going the to France after passing up working with Euler in Russia because um, um, the, 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 the books say that he didn't want to be second fiddle to Euler because, you know, like Saturn and Jupiter, somebody is much brighter than the other person. So Mike, how much longer is this? I'm going to have to drop out about now. Okay. Um, about five more minutes. Maybe you can pick it up next time or? Okay. Can do. Okay. That was really, really good, Mike. Yeah, it's very interesting. See well, you again. Drop in again. Okay. Well, the, 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 well I'll pick up with is the Lorangian points, which okay. is um, what a lot of uh, interesting things happen. Okay. Sorry about that. Right. Good night. No worries. No, that was good. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, okay. Bye. We'll see you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we'll continue next week. I'll be on. Hang in there, Adrian. <laughs> you too. See you guys. Okay. Hey, Adrian, uh, this is old hat to Adrian, I know. So, so Tom, quick question. Sure. Does, your, does this thing time out? Like when you set it up for a Zoom meeting, does it time out at a certain point? No, it doesn't. Uh, it, it, this can go on for a while. Jerry, Jerry just wants to not have it go on beyond nine o'clock, I guess. No, that's so. okay. I was just kind of, kind of set, a, set a limit. So Hank and Bob, I'll talk to you next week, hopefully. All right. Okay. Yeah. It was a it was a good meeting. Thank you. Have, have okay. a good weekend coming up. Christmas weekend. Yeah. Merry All Christmas, right. everyone. We should have been saying the, that. The big the, the big deal for me is winter solstice. That's that's the big one. <laughs> yeah. Now the days are getting longer, thankfully. Yes. Yes. Excellent. All right. See you guys. Right. Bye bye. Y'all. <laughs>